All right. Uh, I thought that if we, if we wait a couple of more minutes, we'll have more uh, more audience, but it seems not. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ali Kuchuri. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, and uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all to this uh, 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 fifth uh, lecture in this academic year uh, of engineering science uh, uh, lecture series, and uh, also 116th lecture in the series. Uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, department, our department, and uh, also the School of Science and Technology, uh, again, I thank you for coming here. Uh, two uh, little announcements. Uh, first, uh, our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Silvia uh, Figuera uh, from the Electrical Engineering Department uh, uh, of uh, Santa Clara University in Santa Clara. And uh, her talk is uh, humanitarian and uh, frugal innovation. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, um, we, have, we, have, we are going to have uh, pizza arriving at uh, uh, 5.30 after the lecture. Our guest speaker for today is uh, uh, Dr. Sohail Yassi uh, from the Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, UC Davis in Davis. And uh, his talk is uh, titled Image uh, Comprehension on Mobile and Cloud, uh, cloud Platforms. Dr. Sohail Qiyasi is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at UC Davis. His research interests are design and optimization of embedded systems for signal processing, machine learning, and multimedia applications. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Sharif University of Technology, Tehran, Iran, in 1998, and his Master of Science and PhD degrees in Computer Science from uh, University of California, Los Angeles, in 2002 and 2004, respectively. He has served on, on the organizing and technical program committees of numerous technical conferences and several journals in uh, the area of, in the general area of computing uh, systems. He is a senior member of, of IEEE and SEM, which in fact, as you know, stands for Association of Computing Machinery. So here is uh, Dr. Diasi. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, for having me here and the attention. Uh, can I have the slides, please? Uh, so what, what I would like to do, I didn't quite have a good sense of the audience. What I did is I prepared uh, a large number of slides. These are some high level slides and some more detailed onto the research my team at UC Davis uh, we, we do. So I, what I would like to do is, as I go through it, get a sense of what you guys like me to focus on and maybe tailor talk as we go. Uh, so it would be helpful if I get some feedback as I kind of make some progress. So uh, I thought a good way of kind of summarizing what the work we do is a poster of some research that my team has been working on for the past probably 10 years. This is a concluded research project at this point, but it gives you a sense of the type of work that we, we have worked on. The idea is you want to do a compilation and mapping framework for multimedia applications, streaming applications, things that you have in vision, in signal processing, in network packet processing, and that, those type of workloads. Uh, and you would like to do it in an energy efficient way and in a programmable way. The problem was posed to us by a colleague of mine who manufactures chips with many cores. So this, the chips he manufactures have, depending on the version, anywhere from tens to hundreds to actually the latest version, he has a thousand lean cores on it. And the problem is, how do you program a thousand cores? Right? That, that's a, the real challenge. So the tool set we have worked on takes an application that's modeled in, in data flow graph takes you through a bunch of optimization steps. For example, you can analyze the task graph, estimate the workload based on that, do some, some sort of assignment to processors to do workload balancing, and then schedule the task, the order in which they have to execute. Uh, and then after you do that, you do some backend optimization in terms of buffer memory optimization, how, uh, on which processor, which logical, on which physical processor in particular, logical processor has to execute, which we call processor binding. And then eventually, once you go through that, those steps, you get to a conventional 
uh, C compilation on a, on a unit processor, which we kind of understand well. You can use a GCC-like compiler to do that, that backend work. So we kind of worked in this world for a number of years. I had a few students who did their grad, grad work in, in, on this problem, and we uh, gained some experience. Okay. One of the takeaways we, we took was uh, streaming applications are important. People have looked at it for many years, and the workloads just keep popping up, new type of workloads. Computer vision was one of the things that I became interested after I worked on this project for a while, which is what I would like to kind of switch gears and talk about next. Okay. Uh, but I thought it would be good to kind of put things in perspective because by training and experience, I'm more of a systems person, a computer architecture person, rather than a, a signal processing or a machine learning per, uh, researcher. Uh, and people who have worked on machine vision and uh, computer vision for a while, they, they, they they, they can attest to the recent kind of boom in the interest in the area. And the reason is, this problem has been around understanding what is in an image, as long as computation has been around. And surprisingly, humans are really good at it. If you show a picture to a human just by blink on an eye, you can tell whether you have a cat in that picture or not, right? Or what is in that image. And amazingly, that's a very difficult problem to, to automate, for computers to, to figure out. If you look at the size and volume of data that's on the internet, the vast majority of it is visual data. It's either video or, or pictures. And it's kind of a bummer that you can't get computers to really process it as well as they do a good job on text. Right? So this problem has really a lot of implications, both business and application-wise. Uh, so there, there was a, has been and continues to be a lot of work on doing computer vision algorithms. And for a long time, they the technique researchers use was trying to come up with features with uh, properties of the local windows in an image that if they could process, they could categorize an image. For example, they would look at a small patch of pixels around, let, let's say, in, in, a, in an image, and then they compute gradient, how the intensity changes, and they would try to form orientations, different kind of features that they thought would be important to a particular uh, image categorization problem. And based off of those features that they thought are important, they would do a classification. Right? Classify whether this image is an image of a cat or a dog or, a, or what have you. Okay. And it worked okay, and for many years, uh, the, the race was who can come up with the more intelligent features, right? But that had a kind of limit, number of limitations to it, because every person, based on experience and other factors, would try to engineer these features. And then all of a sudden, this new technique gained a lot of traction, by trying to do what they call end-to-end -end learning, meaning that you can even get the computer to learn what features are important rather than tell the computer that your feature has to be a gradient of intensity, for example. Okay, uh, how many of you guys have heard of the ImageNet competition? So it may be worthwhile for me to show you some results off of that, and that kind of put things in perspective of why this area has gained so much traction. It, it's a standardized contest started since 2010, and what the way it works is that large data sets of images are labeled. You guys have heard of Amazon Torque. They've given people money to just look at the image and say, this is a cat, that's a dog, right? So a lot of these images are annotated, I think a million or so, and the contest releases part of it to the researchers, part of it is held back, right? And you are free to use your own algorithm to come up with an algorithm that can, that can, that can classify these images into a thousand classes, I believe. And they can test how good of a job you do using the images they held back that you haven't seen yet. Okay, so that's the setup of the contest. In 2012, there was an algorithm out of University of Toronto by a team run by Jeff Hinton that kind of beat the competition by a large gap. And, and his network is called AlexNet. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It, it works based on this idea of automated feature extraction. And it utilizes an idea called the convolutional neural network, which I'm kind of summarizing with CNN here. And that became a state of the art. And it led to a lot of new innovation in understanding images, understanding text, natural languages. And now pretty much all hype you hear about deep learning on data analytics using deep networks of uh, all these new things on synthesizing captions for images that you may have seen on, on Google uh, or, or Facebook work. They all based work on the CNN idea. 
Okay, so it may be work, worthwhile for me to show you a little bit of what he does. Uh, and this is a paper that he presented. Uh, Jeff Hinton was the faculty member, Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya are the two students who worked on it. They're now all with Google. Google bought them for big money. Yeah. Uh, and this is the winner in 2010. So the basic idea is that you have these networks made up in layers, kind of the old school neural network. Uh, and these are the pixels of the image. And every edge here will have a weight whose value you would like to figure out. Right? You would like to learn the value of the weight. And the computation this hidden unit does is it computes a weighted sum of the pixels times the weights that are annotated on these edges. Okay? So you compute this function, weights times the output of the previous layer. And then you apply some sort of nonlinearity to this function. Nonlinearity could be, could be as simple as if the number is positive, just pass it. If it's negative, it's zero. Very simple nonlinearity. Uh, and then he builds a, a large network. So it goes through many layers. I, I'm going to show you a more detailed picture of it, which has many neurons, 60 million parameters, so 60, 630 million connections. Back in 2010, using NVIDIA GPUs of uh, four years old, at the time, it took about a week to train this network. Okay. Uh, and the performance was impressive. So here are, here are, let me show you the results to kind of motivate it, and I come back to call, talk about technical content of it. So here's how it works on some of the examples. Here's the image shown to the, to the tool, and it has to, and the label the, the contest expects is might. And here are the five labels generated by the, by the algorithm. Okay. The reason I'm showing you five is usually one image can be categorized in different ways. For example, you look at this, you can say it's a convertible, which is not a bad guess, but the competition is looking for a grill. So they have it in the top five, which is why the quantification metric is usually top five error. Out of the top five guesses of the algorithm, did you get it right? So if you look at the, the pictures, they vary quite a bit in, in diver, in, variance, uh, and the labels generated here, they're all reasonable labels for the most part. Okay? And even for this part where the tool think, thinks it's Dalmatian, I think that's actually better than cherry, right? But the, the Amazon Turk person thought it's a cherry picture. And the next guess is a grape. So I, don't, I think it's a doing a very good job of understanding what is in the, in the image. Uh, some of the labels, so out of these five labels in this case, none of them is Madagascar cat. I don't know what a Madagascar cat looks like. I don't know about you guys. But the five guesses are all reasonable guesses, D different types of monkeys. Right? Uh, more pictures. And you can tell the network is actually learning something intuitive. For example, this is obviously an abacus with cert complete certainty that the network thinks it's abacus. But for something like this, which is tape player, it thinks, first of all, it's a cellular phone because there's a person and something being held at the, at the ear. Uh, next guess is a reflex camera, maybe. So I think all of these things, like an iPod or a dial telephone, are things whose features exist in, in this picture. Yes? Uh, that would mean that uh, we need, I mean, the computer should go through a lot of uh, the computer learning before? It, it sure does. So out of the, I, I mentioned earlier, there, there are a million images annotated and released to you, to the contestant, to use to train their networks. So those about a million annotated, this annotation is key. It's, these are labeled images. So both the image and what you expect, we expect to see in that image are released to, uh, to the contestants. They are used to figure out all these weight values, all these parameters. And that's the training phase of the algorithm. You bring up a good point. So the algorithm goes through a training phase by which these weights are learned. And after that, the weights are fixed, new images whose label you don't know are passed through this network using fixed weights, and you see which label you, you generate at the other end. Any questions? It's kind of a, a neat technique, and it turns out it works quite well for speech, quite well for text processing, understanding natural languages, problems that have been open for 60, 70 years since computing came about. They all of a sudden are much, much improved in terms of classification accuracy. I'm sure you guys all use Siri or 
OK Google or Alexa, depending on who's your favorite company. And all of them are very accurate. I hope you agree with me in terms of speech processing. And there are tests that, say, that show some of them are better than humans. If you're in a noisy environment, if the person speaks with an accent, they even can beat humans in certain situations. Even there is newer result that on this image classification, they show the better algorithm, newer algorithms, they can beat human. And the reason being a human like me, even if you show me 10 pictures of Madagascar cat, maybe I missed the 11th one, especially if there are pictures of squirrel monkeys and spider monkeys and howler monkeys. But to a tool that those features are, uh, the, the, it learns it. OK. And it, the competition goes through different things. So I, I understand the slides will be released to you guys. If, uh, let me kind of wrap this up. Uh, and you, if you're interested, you can go through this. I wanted to get you to the retrieval experiment. This is an experiment in which one image is given to the tool, and the tool is asked to retrieve other similar images in the data set out of a million some data sets. So the first one is given. This is like an image search without text. And it's doing an impressive job. You show this image, and it shows you a bunch of similar images. Okay. This is now how you upload a face, an image to Facebook. It comes back and says, do you want to tag your friend David? Right? It figures out there's David in it. And it kind of goes through your friends. And uh, this is how Google Photos or Apple Photos, it kind of organizes your pictures. Kind of you label one person, and it finds all instances of that person in the, in the data set. So the reason I'm kind of spending a lot of time is hopefully making the case that this is the future. You have a lot of image data. We need to understand how things are done on it. So why do I care? I'm not a machine learning person, and I can't really contribute to this problem. Is somebody else, a machine learning expert, will come up and come up with a network that works. So I'm going to spend some time talking about this is the AlexNet architecture, how it works there. But then after you train it, and you fix the weights, and you learn the weights, you need to execute it, right? You need to apply it to smartphones that users use, or to cameras installed everywhere in our buildings. And you want to execute this computation. And it turns out it's a very intensive computation. It takes weeks or months to learn on a very parallel processor with multiple GPUs and, and servers. And it doesn't take as long to run it to do inference, to apply a new image and see what class it belongs to. But nevertheless, it takes long. It takes seconds on a mobile phone, for example. And it takes a lot of energy. So if you are to deploy it to users to do image recognition or voice recognition, how can you do this? So that's a problem I'm kind of interested in. Uh, let me show you the architecture of how it works. So the input. For this AlexNet uh, structure, the input here is an image which is 224 by 224 pixels. And it's got three channels of red, green, and blue. Okay, so that's the image provided to you. To, to you. Uh, a moving filter of 11 by 11 times 3 is applied to this. Each of them produces one pixel in this output feature map. Okay, So you have 96 output feature maps here. Each of them requires its own three-dimensional kernel. So there's 11 times 11 times three weights to learn values I don't know. And I have to learn them based on training data to be able to compute the value in one of these pixels in one of these output feature maps. OK, and you repeat and repeat and repeat. So there are so many weights. That's how this 60 million number came about. Uh, and at the end of it, there are 1,000 classes in which you classify the image too. OK, so the, the training process tries to figure out these weights. Then you fix the weights for new images that you haven't seen. You put it here. You compute and evaluate this entire function. And you s figure out out of 1,000 classes which one is the winner. OK. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we try to do this computation more efficiently. Uh, can I ask you a question? Please, yeah. Uh, in the in order to identify the features, which are very important to, I mean, to, to know what the thing is, during the learning, uh, um, the learning phase, uh, should, should one uh, provide these features to the computer, or uh, basically <coughs> just like So that's, that's been the debate that the community has been having for as long as machine learning has been around, right? 
the traditional way of doing it was the person should hand engineer the features, okay? Because the person knows the domain, the person is an expert, right? So knows that the intensity variation is important, for example. Uh, and a lot of the algorithms like Gabor filters, or if you know machine processing, you can name a bunch of algorithms. Like uh, HOG stands for histogram of gradients, or SIFT stands for scale invariant feature transform. These are all well-known established algorithms that used to be a state of the art. So they all based, work based on that principle, that an expert knows what is good to be extracted as a feature. The new methodology is that it doesn't matter. You just give me a deep network, a lot of data, a lot of computing, and I figure out automatically what features are important for your problem. So it turns out this new method works better, but it took a lot of computation for us to get to this point, right? So now that cloud is there and a lot of data is there, it's possible. 15 years ago, it was not possible. Um, so that layered architecture I showed you, in the early levels, it learns. After you train it, you don't know what it's looking for. But after it learns it, it turns out the early layers are actually learning things like this, which are gradient in intensity, very simple patterns. And those patterns are combined in the next layer to form corners, for example. Then they're combined in the next layer to build small objects, then they're combined in the next layer to look for big, complex features, and so forth. So intuitively, that's how different layers learn what's important. Um, OK, so now can I drill a little bit deep into what computation takes place, and then we can see into how efficient optimization, efficient computation execution can play a role here. So the convolution is a typical sliding window computation. This is, let's say, your input data. You have a window, and you overlap the window with part of the image patch, and you just multiply out the pixel with the corresponding weight here in the kernel, and you calculate a running weighted sum, and that gives you the value of the pixel in the convolved image. So when I say 2D convolution, that's a, what we all know as engineers. You just do a sliding window algorithm. A 3D convolution is the very same thing, except that you now have a number of, for example, in this case, 96 different two-dimensional convolution. So the number of parameters grow. And you compute all of that to just compute one output feature map. OK, so 96 input feature maps are convolved with, in this example, 96 by 5 by 5 kernels. And one 55 by 55 output feature map is, is produced. And if I want to have so many upper feature maps, I need to have distinct three-dimensional kernels for each of them. OK. So if you were to implement this as a software implementation, think of how many loops you would need. Right? You need one loop to, to go over all the upper feature maps. Per upper feature map, you need to go over all of the input feature maps. That's two. right? Then. For each of them, you need to go over the dimensions of the, the kernel. That's 3 and 4. And that just gives you one pixel here. So you need, again, to iterate here and here. That gives you six iterations to do the entire computation. Um, so I, I think I talked about this, that the initial layers, they try to use locality to extract local features. That Here you do global feature extraction. The last layer, they, they classify the thousand bins that you. OK, uh, so here's the basic observation you, I, I'm hoping, agree with. The network goes through two phases. You train it first. Initially, you don't know its value, the, the value of the weights. You train it. And then after you learn the feature, the, the weights, then you can deploy it on user data at, on user devices. OK. Uh, the training scales with the number of researchers, because researchers play with different network architectures. They train it with data sets. So if you have 10 research, research, researchers, they would uh, roughly try out 10 times as many networks as you would with one researcher. OK. Uh, and it's typically done on powerful servers with server-grade GPUs or other accelerators. For example, Microsoft has FPGAs in their cloud. Google has their own ASIC they call TPU for Tensor Plus Processing Unit. So they all try to accelerate this computation. Um, 
But the testing or inference is when the weights are learned and you fix it and you deploy it to the application, to, to users' devices. Then it scales with the number of users, which are in the billions, right? So it, here you want to make things fast because that means your product will get to market faster, but energy efficiency is not really much of a concern. Whereas when you deploy to users, it matters that it runs fast and it's energy efficient because otherwise the application on mobile device is not going to run. So, and why is it the problem? Because when you look at the depth, the how many layers you need in the network to do a good job, so this is AlexNet, which I mentioned and showed you the paper a little bit, that won the competition back in 2012. In 2012, AlexNet, I believe, was the only team that used this approach. Since then, it's mushroomed, and now every team uses a, vari a variation of this convolutional neural network idea. There is no other ways of, at least now the community thinks this is the best idea we've got so far. So this is the VGG, two different versions, or actually four different versions. This is a winner out of Oxford, which has a very uh, prolific vision group. This is Google Net, another network based on, uh, out of Google. So this has 21 layers into it. VGG has, depending on variation, anywhere from seven to seven or 16 layers into it. Okay, and this shows you what is the top five error rate out of the so many images, what's the likelihood that you would get it right in the top five guesses you would make. So you'll see how it decreases with the number of layers you increase. Microsoft has a version that has 150 some layers into it. Right, so <laughs> it's a, the problem essentially has boiled down to whoever has more resources can do a better job, right? And it, it's okay for the cloud, not okay for the user devices. So uh, I talked a little bit about these different platforms that you have to execute this on. To kind of summarize it, you could either run it in the cloud. Uh, three, four years ago, the, the frameworks were not there. So there was a lot of research being done on how you can train these networks efficiently on many computers. But now, this is essentially a solved problem. There's every comp major company has their own internal tool sets, their own accelerators that they get made av make available to their machine learning researchers to try out different networks. Still, it takes, because the networks are also growing with the computational power available to, to the researchers, still it takes uh, one, weeks, in cases, months to train these networks. Uh, but the issue there is really acceleration for coming up with newer and better networks. You, you essentially have limited constraints in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, you could run it on GPUs or CPUs, and it's software programmable, uh, I mean a single server rather than many of them in the cloud. Uh, GPU is effectively a supercomputer on a chip, right? So you can still run many threads in parallel, it runs fast, but a server-grade GPU typically consumes about 300 watts of power. That's out, definitely out of the envelope if you're carrying a, an iPhone or an Android device. You could do your own ASIC. This is a rule, route that some startups are taking, betting that this is going to be a very large volume market, so we, it's worth doing an ASIC for it. Google recently assound, uh, announced TPU, uh, stands for Tensor processing unit, which is an ASIC for accelerating this type of computation. And it's internal to their structure. They deploy it in their data centers. Uh, and Or use an FPGA, right? A programmable logic that you can program to build your own uh, circuitry. The good is that the energy efficiency versus programmability is, is attractive. The, the downside is it's not as easy to use as software. So it takes more work and uh, not as friendly for programming. Uh, so we have focused on essentially trying to focus on inference, meaning these networks are trained, the weights are known, and you want to deploy it to either a robot, for example, in agricultural settings where you can afford to have an FPGA, or to users' devices like cell phones, where you don't have a flexibility of changing the hardware, but you're just bound to use whatever hardware is on the phone. Please. Uh, the reason that uh, people now can use the ASIC, is it that uh, they use a certain algorithm to do that, to do computation? So, exactly. So the, the algorithm for training is 
a well-known algorithm called gradient descent. It's a well-known public algorithm that has been around for many years. The core computational crux of it is convolution operation, three-dimensional convolution. So if you can accelerate that, you get, get a lot of mileage. If you follow the news, like EE Times or other tech news, this has been the whole big data, deep learning, these buzzwords get a lot of attention. And all these major companies, Amazon, Apple, and so forth, they have major investments in this area. Uh, and they're, they have a lot of time internal tool sets for their own work. For example, Google has this software framework called TensorFlow you may have heard of. In TensorFlow, you can model your own network, you can throw data at it, it visualizes how you can train, and it, it does, it's an open source publicly available tool. Uh, and TensorFlow on the back end uses, it can use it the TPU for Google users or for the rest of us who are not as resourceful, you can ship it to a CPU or a GPU or other uh, computation platforms. Uh, so this was kind of a high level introduction to this field and I, if, are there any questions or anything you would want me to spend more time on? What do you guys think? Before moving on, maybe I can show a little bit of a, if I have internet connection, I can show you a little bit of a demo, yeah. So if you Google image recognition, let's say, so this is a visual recognition demo. I think this is by uh, IBM, based on the Watson. So you can upload your own URL, give it an image, and it runs a bunch of this computation, and it tells you what it thinks of that image. So you can run it on a computation. And these are images they provide, so I'm gonna just show it because I think that will be, work well. So it thinks with almost probability of one, it's a female, the picture of a female. With that probability, the age between 35 to 44. Celebrity match with certainty, it thinks she's Whoopi Goldberg. Okay. And it may not be as impressive to millennials, but to old timers, it's very impressive. Right? <laughs> and if you think it's bias, uh, let me give, Ali, why don't you give me a word? It doesn't have to be a person. It, Diagnostic? More of a, more of a specific. You want to. A specific a, thing, a, right? A, a lion. A lion, let's say. <laughs> so let's say. So these are the lions. Which picture should I pick? Let's say, no, if you take. How about this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to pick the. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I can run it on. If I squeak, really. So it thinks it's an animal, a mammal, with point point three seven probability it's a lion, right? Uh, let's go down. So it doesn't have more categories on it. If you run a person, sometimes you get other cool things. For example, let me try. I used to love Kobe Bryant, so let me see if it works well on him. Which there were two lions, and then could it recognize that there are two rather than one? Uh, so, so new algorithms can. The, the, there are two correlated problems. There's recognition, what is in that image, and uh, localization, where in that image the thing is. Okay. So ImageNet has both categories. It can do, it has a category for recognition, another category for uh, localization. And if you do localization, you can count right. how many of them. So it thinks it's a person, uh, it's of basketball, uh, has to do with sport, right? The age is in that range. Uh, it's a taker. <laughs> 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 you got it right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it was a tough one, huh? 
<laughs> so it, under celebrity search, you didn't find it as brilliant. But anyways, I think it's good enough, right? So now if you Google up deep learning or these APIs, you'll find startups that they give implementations and open the API for you to do your own app. Or, yes? Um, how well does it do like blurry images? Does it take a critical, like huge hit, or does it kind of do blurry images well too? So technically, uh, these are two decoupled problem, meaning that, that you can always take the blur away first and then do processing on it, right? So this demo, uh, I don't think it does it. But technically, that's not a hard problem. You can do a focused step before running the algorithm on it. And funny you ask, because a lot of these low-level image processing algorithms, like denoising, deblurring, filling in a missing part in an image, they used to be done based on somebody telling you that you have to use this filter. Now, they also use the same approach, machine learning, where the weights are figured out based on all these images. So newer digital cameras, what they use for deblurring, denoising, is they show the algorithm a lot of well-focused images and blurred version of the same thing. So it figures out the weights, and then it applies them to new blurred images. Actually, it's a very, uh, I'll get to you in a bit. It's a very emerging, kind of growing area of how can you apply machine learning to different fields. Yeah, please. Uh, for writing the algorithms, what typically, like what language do they typically use? To implement the algorithm? Yes. Uh, so depend on your back end, right? Depending on what platform you want to execute this computation on. If you want to map to a processor, you can use any of the languages that is available. The typical networks, if you use one of these company frameworks I mentioned, for example, in Google, you can use TensorFlow uh, that has a C++ and a Python interface, I think. So you can use either Python or C++. But Facebook internally uses Torch or a different, that, that is based on a language called Lua. I think choice of a language is, is not so important as the algorithmic concepts, right? Then if you know that, you can capture it in one language or the other. For GPUs, the dominant framework is NVIDIA's CUDA. You might have heard of it. For FPGA work, you typically have to do some sort of RTL design. So it would be very log or high-level synthesis using OpenCL or something like that. It depends on what platform you target. Uh, the police department, are you aware uh, whether they use a computer to identify a person who has done something wrong or just go and then there is, there, is, or there is more of it coming along, right? So he, license plate readers have been around for many years, right? They can detect license plates so they can know where different cars are. Uh, now I saw a call for proposals from Department of Justice where they're looking for the same thing, that they show images of criminals or suspects, right? And they want the same person to be found in different videos, right? So they're looking into application of this to, it's definitely, I think, of an interest to them, at least judging by the call I saw. Right. How much of it is done today, I'm not sure. Right. Uh, another question. The Department of Defense has been doing this thing for a long, long time. Sure. In fact, sure. You know, and then, uh, for example, to identify where the nuclear uh, you know, things are and so on. And uh, do they use the same? Well, they, probably they are using the same thing. But in those days, we are talking about like maybe 20 or 30 yes. years ago when they exactly. started these things. Exactly. What they, what they so do. a lot of the, so let me go back to the slide and, and talk about the. Yeah. Uh, so these two things I mentioned, the histogram of gradients and, oops. Uh, the histogram of gradient and scale invariant feature transform, SIFT and HOG, right? So these type of features, they were state of the art. And I think SIFT came about early 2000, about 15, 16, 17 years ago. Yeah. HOG was older than that, I believe. And I know for a fact that SIFT was a state of the art for about 10 years. So, th so I, I actually got approached by some defense project where they wanted to do SIFT on FPGAs. Right. So I'm, I'm guessing they had some right. use for it, right? But the thing is, if you restrict the application domain, like if you are flying drones and you're looking for tanks, it's much simpler problem, right? right? Yeah. Whereas if you want to detect about 10,000 classes, all these different animals and different poses, and that's a potentially a harder problem. Right. Yeah. 
And the other thing is none of them are 100% accurate, none of these algorithms. So even humans are not 100% accurate. So I think for Department of Defense, what it does, there's a lot of imagery. So computing narrows it down to a few that they want the person to look at. If I can ask another question. Sure thing. Uh, uh, basically, the uh, biologists, or let's say the doctors, or whatever, they uh, sometimes use uh, some algorithm to identify the, uh, the chromosomes, which are not good nature or whatever. And with that, they can go and find out whether the person was that I mean, what, what sort of person is psychologically. Sure. Uh, do they use uh, any computer thing, or just they do it under the microscope? What? No, no. So, so nowadays, nowadays is increasingly computerized, right? Even NIH, Nas National Institutes of Health, has an institute for application of imaging in general to, to medical, right? So there's a lot of work on different imaging technology diagnostics for medical applications, and increasingly they use big data and machine learning, in increasingly so. Um, in the genetics, that's definitely the case because you're dealing with many chromosomes, right? That is just impossible for humans to process. And a lot of patient cases, so only computers can come and tell this is a pattern important to that disease. Right, exactly. uh, it's like a inter search on text documents in the internet, right? Google does such a fine job, but for a human, it would be impossible to process the volume that indexes. <laughs> Uh, other questions? So I have about 15 minutes, and I kind of went over the overview. What, what I would like to do if there are no questions, kind of go deeper into a little bit of work we do. That would be the result of our lab. And if it doesn't interest you or you want me to focus on something else, give me some feedback, and I'm happy to, to adjust it. OK. So for acceleration, the observation we had was that this is based on some number we ran. This is the AlexNet. It had an eight different layers. And th the first five layers are convolutional operation. The next two layers are fully connected layers and then the classifier, right? And it shows you how many cycles are spent in each layer. Okay. So it shows you that the vast majority of cycles, roughly 90%, are spent in convolutions. Okay. And that's where you want to focus if you want to accelerate, right? You want to go after the money. The acceleration of the fully connected layers is kind of pointless. Think of Amdahl's law. So that's where uh, we, we have focused on convolution layer acceleration. Uh, and then what happens is the, the typical acceleration scenario, you have resources to run computation in parallel, okay? And then you have to bring data on chip to feed that beast, to, to let the computation run. And there has to be balance between the two. Right? If you have a lot of computation, not enough memory bandwidth, then some compute resources are we're unable to utilize them. Right? And if the other way, there's a lot of bandwidth but not enough processing, then you're leaving optimization on the table. You can still add more resources and crunch more numbers. Right? So our work has focused on, given a network, given a neural network, and an FPGA with known resources, how can you formally kind of match the two, the bandwidth available to you and the amount of area that you can use to build parallel resources. Uh, so the, the tool we have goes through a bunch of steps to synthesize those networks. Uh, and if you look at the, at the typical computation that happens in a layer in neural network, you have a bunch of weights and input feature maps come in. They, they, you get to do a convolution here. Uh, and you do this across a bunch of different images, and they all get added up and give result for one particular pixel in one particular output feature map. Okay. So in terms of dependency, what depends on what and what computation is parallel, I can have all sorts of parallelism in this scheme. I have, within a kernel computation, all those nine multiplications, or if it's a 3 by 3 window, or 25 bits of 5 by 5 window, they can run in parallel. That's an intra-kernel parallelism. Between different kernels that are being applied to different input feature maps, I could run them in parallel. That's interkernel parallelism. Different output feature maps could be computed in parallel as well. That's inter-output parallelism. So you have all sort of ways of explore, exploiting these sources of parallelism. And the trade-off is 
you have limited resources in terms of area and memory. If I turn the knob high on one, that implicitly means I kind of to turn the knob down on the other uh, parallelism, and which is going to give you the best solution. Uh, so what, what we have done is kind of formalize this problem. So we, let me not, not bore you with the details, but we have parameters that kind of model how this problem works. And here's a kind of the template of the architecture. There's a memory. This is what happens on the FPGA. The memory controller brings data on chip. And these are the input feature maps. IFM stands for input feature map. And these are the weight matrices. They are being pipelined in an execution, and the output feature maps is here. And then after you're done, it goes back to memory. Right? So I, I don't want to bore you with the specific model. It's detailed. If you're interested, I can point you to the paper. What I want to show you is this. Now, depending on how much these knobs are turned, how much you decide to exploit one parallelism source versus the other versus the other, you end up with different design points. How can I compare all these design points? So what we do is we measure how each of these design points, how much comp computation to communication ratio is, right? and how much computation it does, how many resources it needs. Now, given a specific FPGA, you're kind of limited on how much resources it offers you. So this bar tells you anything above this bar is physically impossible for me to build. I don't have that much transistors to build it. Below is feasible. And this line, slope, tells you how much memory bandwidth you have. Anything on the upper side of the line, you don't, it, it requires more memory bandwidth that your hardware can sustain. So again, this would be infeasible for the given platform. Things down here are all feasible solutions. So out of this, which do you think gives you the best performance? Go ahead. A little bit more, like right to the right of the line. Here? About like a 90 on the y-axis. So th that, that's absolutely right. You want to have the higher performance, and you want it to be on this side. So it would be one of these guys, right? So out of these ones, do you want to pick this way or this one? So I told you this slope of the line is the memory bandwidth that you require, right? Anything higher than that is unsustainable. Anything <coughs> lower is sustainable. So ideally, you would like to apply less pressure on the memory. Right? So ideally, you would like to go with uh, that point. Yeah. Theoretically, this is the same performance, and this is feasible. Practically, you want to reduce the pressure on the memory. So it's more of a framework to formalize this problem and kind of explore the space systematically and come up with the architecture that matches the resources to the computation requirement. Um, I, th th there's a lot of details I'm kind of glossing over, and I, it, if you don't follow, it's perfectly fine because I'm not really going over the details. But I, I think the takeaway is the the approach in formalizing and, and exploring the design space. Uh, and it shows that if you have dynamic parameters, so this is a comparison between different schemes whether the parameters are dynamic or not, and different numbers in terms of how it improves them and so forth. So this is a paper my student published at ASP DAC last year. Now let me switch gears, go over this part, talk a little bit about, I have probably five minutes, to talk about the other case where you want to deploy this to Android devices, to a smartphone. So Android devices have, depending on the phone obviously, you have typically some sort of GPU. So here's a, the architecture of our Mali, which is a GPU ARM builds, it's an IP, so different companies can uh, license it, pay money to ARM, and, and manufacture it. And it's typically used for showing graphics and animation on your screen on, for this phone, but you can also utilize it to do computation on it. Okay. Uh, it's similar to a desktop GPU. The differences are it's much smaller, so you have less parallel ALUs. And it shares a memory with the CPU, so you don't have to send data across explicitly. The data is going to be shared in the memory. And it, it's, more, it's got more limitations in terms of thread synchronization and uh, the access you have to it. The access has to be through Android. And Android has this framework called RenderScript, which is the programmer's gateway or API to accessing that, that GPU, mapping computation to that. 
So we've done a little bit of work on taking a convolution operation. So here are the six nested loops I mentioned. These are the output feature maps, the input feature maps, the dimension of the one output feature map, and the dimensions of the kernel. So which gives you six iterations and kind of headache to, to run it on the processor. So what he has done is he has, first of all, parallelized it on a GPU so you can have a thread per pixel of the output feature map. So you create so many threads, each thread just computes one pixel in one output feature map. And you just tell the GPU, execute them in parallel. There are much, much more threads than the number of resources available in the hardware. So the hardware has to sequ sequ sequentially serialize it. Okay. Uh, the other thing he has done is he utilizes what Android has as a vectorized dot product. So he packs four different numbers into one uh, float four on the 28-bit data, data type. And then, then you run one operation on it, and it gives you a dot product on those four words rather than just one, uh, one multiplication. And you need to do some data reordering to, to de be able to deal with that. Because if you think about it, this scheme requires these four things to be sequential addresses in memory. Right? Initially, images are stored like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth. So, but when I'm trying to compute the, uh, the result for one pixel, which is the result of the convolution, you have to multiply this pixel by its own weight, this other pixel from the second image by its own weight, this third image by, from another image by its own weight, and so forth. So you, need, you expect the data to be in a different order. So you'll have to not only reorder them on the input data, on the next layer, generate them in the order you expect, in the right order. So he also does this, comp this part. He optimizes this, and it gets to vectorized computation. And what I want to show you kind of as a takeaway is, is this. OK. So this is a, another network similar to AlexNet called SqueezeNet. It's a smaller network. Accuracy is very similar to AlexNet and fit for mobile execution. And this is run on Nexus 5 phone. So it's a log scale. So you, when you go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 1,000, that's about 10 times faster, right? So the purple shows you the initial sequential execution that runs on a CPU, on mobile CPU. The red bar shows you if you parallelize it but use precise computation. And the green is if you use the same thing, but rather than precise, use imprecise computation. Turns out a lot of these CNNs are robust to noise and imprecision, which is how the brain works too. So you can give up on the accuracy of computation, but save on the runtime and energy. So in aggregate, uh, depending on the layer you look at, it could be about close to three orders of magnitude faster, right? So you used to run in seconds, now it runs in tens of milliseconds, which is the big deal. Same thing with energy. So, um, so this is speed up. Now let me show you the energy consumption. Now if you want to deploy to robots and drones and phones, the battery is limited. So sequential uh, execution on three different generation of phones, Galaxy S7, Nexus 6P, and, and Nexus 5. So this is the energy consumption in joules, right? And the, compar the comparison, if you use the imprecise computation for processing of the same image. So it shows you that you can get on the order of 3x again your energy savings, which is, again, a big deal. Uh, these are some total energy consumption. So your device energy consumption is not just the computation. You're also doing other things. Uh, so this, it's even more impressive in that sense because here I think the, the, the radio interface is turned off and the screen brightness is minimized to kind of minimize the contribution of other things. But nevertheless, the improvement you get is kind of impressive. Uh, now that this kind of intelligence is being shipped to more and more what I call edge devices, the devices that users carry and not the data center and the back end of the, the computing stack. Uh, there's more demand for low energy fast execution. 
Okay, so uh, I think I'm out of time. So what I'll, I'll do is I'll wait here, just a couple of points to sum up. I think this machine intelligence is upon us. There's a lot, <laughs> just more data being generated. All these sensors are pumping data out. And you just need a need to have a way, need to have a way to efficiently process all the all that data. And I think it's the right area. If you're looking for an area to focus on, there's a lot of interesting problems that somebody with an engineering background can contribute to. So with that, let me stop here. I should acknowledge all the students who contributed to the project, the funding agencies, and some references. But let me wait. thank you guys. Please. All right. In the case of uh, automated diagnostics, see, uh, these days, you know, we have MRIs and so forth, and then they, they take the individual, uh, you know, images of, of cancer, let's say. Uh, can they, at this stage, use the computer to diagnose, like, whether it's cancer or whatever? So it, it really depends who you ask. If, if you ask machine learning people, they say yes. If you ask doctor, they say no. If they ask insurance companies, they say, Who's liable, right? <laughs> so it really depends on who, and, and which is a big deal, right? Because same thing with autonomous driving, right? The, the, the computer scientist thinks we can do it. The insurance companies say, if you do it, are you going to pay for accidents and all that, right? The drive, if you take the driver out of the loop. So, so it, it kind of depends on what level you're considering it. Uh, I think at, at, at this point, the conclusion is that it, computing serves as consultation and recommendation to doctors. It doesn't take them over, but it gives suggestions. That, but the still doctor is in the driving, wheel, in the driving seat, yeah. Which I think, at least for the time being, is the right way of going about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Now, I, I'm kind of curious about core utilization. If you were to double the number of cores, does that cut the runtime in half? Depends on the computation, right? That's right. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. Is what is typical now? What what is, what is kind of the norm? So it really depends on the computation. Right, right. But right. in terms of the be very best ones. So you're saying for this computation? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, inherently, it's a very like, parallel computation, right? Right, right. And it, but it requires a lot of data as well. So, yeah. so if, if what you have in mind is two cores versus four cores versus eight or 16, mm -hmm. you get close to full utilization. Okay. Close to full. Okay. But if you have your, in mind 1,000 versus 10,000, like a data center scale, you don't because you're shifting a lot of data around. Yeah? Okay. The new issues come up yeah. when you get to larger data. Okay. Yeah. But, but, but this is a, an embarrassingly parallel application in some sense. Not embarrassing, but very parallel application. Right. So it gives you a lot of ways to optimize it, yeah. Other questions? If uh, there are no other questions, let me uh, thank Dr. Kwasi, who has come you know, all the way from Davis to remember now. <laughs> uh, and then now he, he needs to go back. So let's uh, give him a hand. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.